If you're looking for a community to accompany you in your leadership journey, you should join our Savvy Supervisors Facebook group. Insights and videos, supports, great group discussions, and weekly themes to help you hone your leadership skills, all for free. You can find it at SavvySupervisors.com. That will take you directly to the Facebook page. And if you're interested in finding out more about our supervisory leadership course, which is our signature course and has been used with over 100 companies with amazing results, you can check that out at supervisoryleadership.co. That's supervisoryleadership.co. Within, between, among, the interaction between stories. That is the theme of my guest today, Ron Carucci, who is the co-founder and managing partner at Navalent, working with CEOs and executives pursuing transformational change for their organizations, leaders, and industries. From startups to Fortune 10s, turnarounds to new markets and strategies, overhauling leadership and culture to redesigning for growth, he has a 30-year track record helping some of the world's most influential executives tackle challenges of strategy, organization, and leadership. Ron is a regular contributor to HBR and Forbes and has been featured in Fortune, CEO Magazine, Business Insider, MSNBC, Inc., Business Week, Smart Business, and many more. Ron led a 10-year longitudinal study on executive transition to find out why over 50% of leaders fail within their first 18 months of appointment and to uncover the four differentiating capabilities that set successful leaders apart. These findings are highlighted in his groundbreaking Amazon book, which has become one of the Amazon's number one bestsellers, Rising to Power, which he co-authored with Eric Hansen. So that is, it's a very, very impressive bio, Ron, and I'm so honored to have you on the podcast, Culture and Leadership Connections. So welcome. Marie, the pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. I I usually like to ask the guests if they would fill in some more personal side to the the bio that I usually read out, because the bio gives you some idea of the accomplishments and really the greatness of the people that we're working with and, and why it's a good reason to listen to them. But those individual backstories are what's really compelling. Sure. Mind sharing something about uh, yourself that we could uh, let the audience know about? Yeah, well, so uh, I began my career in the arts, in music and theater, uh, very in very early age, when I was studying when I was 10, uh, went to school uh, in New York City at Juilliard, um, and quickly learned that I bored easily. So when all of my friends were going, wow, what a great job, I'd be thinking, well, I have to do the same thing eight times a week for how long? Uh, and I learned that while I loved telling great stories, it was interesting to do, um, engaging other people in their stories was far more interesting to me and far more likely to not be boring uh, in my life. So early in my 20s, I was able to switch careers and begin a path toward uh, the work I do today. That's great. Tell me a little bit more about the music side. Were you playing an instrument? Uh, what, what were no, you... I was a voice major. A voice major. So you were singing. Yeah. That's wonderful. And, and theater. So I was on the stage. Acting and singing. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm sure you were excellent at it. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it was it was it was fun for a season. Uh, many of those skills transfer to the work we do today. But like I said, embodying the stories of other people is an interesting thing to do. And and you know, the one of the earliest moments of discovery for me was, I was with a I took a job tour. I decided if I went, went touring and did repertory theater, at least maybe that might be more interesting because there was more variety. And I we we were working in Europe, and the company did a lot of training programs for the U.S. military and State Department over in Europe. We were in Dachau of all places, and of all places in the chapel at Dachau. And at the time, they didn't have the term diversity and inclusion, but if they did, that's what this workshop would have been called. So you can imagine how many ironies there were to be doing a workshop on valuing differences at the chapel at Dachau. Totally, very and, ironic. And none of that was lost on us, even in my early 20s. Well, the, and the audience was full of military and civilians and spouses and State Department officials and Germans and Americans. and. At one point, a U.S. soldier stood up in, as, in, during a discussion time, and he said, I'm just so tired of being trained to hate. One of the first things I thought in my head privately was, how, how could something I had done up here make him think that? But I was so fascinated by what he meant by it, that even after we processed what he said very vulnerably in, in the group setting, I wanted to know more. So, you know, you're in Munich, so you go out for beer. That's what you do. And so I went out and he wasn't much uh, older or younger than me, maybe a couple, maybe by a year or two, we were relatively peers. We sat for hours and I just was so fascinated by his willingness to discuss that, 
the fact that he'd been thinking about it, the fact that something we, some of the material we presented had caused him to want to name that concern. And I think that was the beginning for me to understand that. Sure, we told an interesting story from the front of the room, but his story was far more meaningful to me. And the chance to, the privilege to go entertain that or engage that was um, far more life-giving for me. And I think that's, though I didn't have language for it at the time, I think that's where the beginning of me understanding that started. That's a great story. It just shows how engaged you can get with somebody else's story to the point where you really, instead of being threatened by somebody saying that to you in the middle of a workshop uh, where you're in charge, you thought right away, hmm, how can I use this? What's behind it? Uh, what can we learn from this? Yeah. And how courageous that he wanted to say it. Hmm. Yeah. And you just really honored the person who said it and focused on that person and how they might have been feeling and what their experiences could have been so that you could get past that. I'm sure that also left a lasting impression on the people in the workshop that you're working with. Well, my guess is that some of them were feeling the same thing and didn't have the courage to say it. So very courageous of you to have been able to accept that. So, which leads me kind of to my next question, which is, can you share a couple of incidents from your childhood that you believe made you into the person you are today? Sure. Uh, in junior high school, you know, when I was in my rebellious years, experimenting with, you know, breaking rules and boundaries, I was caught doing something terrible. And my mother uh, loved me enough to call the police. And uh, this was, I think I was in ninth grade or 10th grade. And she um, was heartbreaking for her. Uh, so... I was using marijuana. Uh, I was storing it in my neighbor's well and my aunt saw me go and take it. And she told my mother and my mother was devastated. You know, I, I was normally a good kid, honor roll kid, you know, was involved in music and sports and all the good, good things. But this was my moment of rebellion and she was not going to have it. And she cared enough for me to make me feel the consequences of that action. And I, I mean, through her tears, I knew that I had not only crossed a lot of lines, but um, I had broken her heart and she cared. And at the time I was enraged and embarrassed and humiliated that she would do this. But, you know, when I look today and I read about all the research of, uh, in Gen Z, where we have trained our children to not be resilient and we've coddled them too much and we've not prepared them to be resilient and face struggles. We told them what, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. I'm grateful that my parents allowed me to um, experience some of the consequences of my own choices in a way that allowed me to understand choice and consequence later. And not only allowed you to experience the consequences, but put you directly in the path of being forced to face the consequences. Yes. I mean, pr pr provoke them. It wasn't just that they were going to punish me or, or like many parents, try and cover it up. Um, and, and that was a turning moment for me to, to say, okay, I'm going to take life seriously. And I had, um, you know, I was probably a little bit overweight and I got healthy and I lost a lot of weight and committed to my, the values my parents wanted me to live by. And it was a great changing point for me. And it made my high school years very different. Yeah, because it made you see that there were direct outcomes, there were direct consequences to the things you did, and that being held accountable by somebody that you loved, even though it was hard for them, would have made a lasting impression, I would think. Well, it's, I mean, it's made me, I mean, I think for my whole life, it's made me think about the notion of choice and volition and the role they play. Um, and in my work, when I see others who have forfeited their volition or who are overly binary in their choices, um, you know, if you look at the echo chambers of today and the, the horrible binaries we put ourselves in, this sort of this culture of contempt, where you have these false binaries between sides. We can't even hear each other anymore. We can't even listen. The culture has become so di divisive. And part of that is not realizing that we have accountability to the group. Well, to, to the, not only our own group, our own tribe. The larger group. And we're still all part of one tribe, even though we have sub-tribes. Yeah, and one we, human race. <laughs> we don't take that accountability seriously anymore, Marie. We devalue other groups that aren't like us. Uh, and even within the group, we allow, I mean, I, I, you know, human, I, you know this as a clinician, but, you know, as human beings, at our core, we are all wired with hardwired with two sometimes opposing needs. Right? We want to be individuals that stand out, and we long for community and intimacy. Right. And it's the we-me conflict. And sometimes when my me conflicts with your we, it creates tensions, and that's healthy, and that's normal, and we have to work through that, where we can both honor our me's and both honor our we's. But today, organizations don't teach that. They optimize for one. They, they have cultures that are highly individualistic to optimize for, for me or cultures that are overly consensus driven and collaborative at the expense of individuality and optimized for we. And it's at the blending of both of those things where I think human beings are at their best. But we, I, I think we've lost the notion of how, how to do it. I think it's because it takes a lot of work and it's hard and it's messy and it's just easy to polarize 
or we've, I think we've come to believe it's easier to polarize. It's not easier at all. And we're setting ourselves up for some painful consequences if we don't figure out how to get back to a place of civility and tolerance and openness and curiosity. Um, we fuse the idea of listening to a different point of view as affirming it. Which and isn't necessarily the case. It's not the, it's not the case at all. I don't know how we learn that, um, but it's, we have to learn to put that pause in there. Right. You know, your story reminds me a little bit of uh, several careers ago. I was a drama teacher, a junior, <laughs> a junior high drama teacher, and uh, I had a group of kids that I was working with. And one of the girls in the group, uh, a couple of times I told her that uh, her behavior was uh, bullying the others, was causing her to be at risk for membership. You know, she wouldn't be able to belong to this group, which was mm-hmm. the long-term group. That, you know, she had to smarten up or she was going to have to leave because I wasn't going to tolerate her abusive behavior. Mm. We were doing these things where um, they were taking a scenario from their lives and then they were replaying them and different people were coming in and replacing them. And then we'd ask, is this realistic? And then, is this something you would do? And they, does this make the situation better? Is it better for you? Is it better for the other person? Is it better for the environment? How is this change going to make things better? And they would keep working through until they got something that they said it wasn't cheesy, if it wasn't cheesy. So we did this a few times and then we'd sit down, we'd debrief. So we're de- sitting in this circle debriefing and this girl who's the bully says, I've decided that all my life when I did something bad, my mom would cover for me. And Mm -hmm. that's making me into the kind of person that nobody's going to want to be around. I could graduate from high school and everyone's going to say, there's that girl who was the bully. There's the girl I was scared of. I don't want to be remembered that way. And just said that in the group like that, just laid it out there. Wow. And the, one of the kids that is a long silence because they (laughs) they weren't going to just like forgive her just like that. Right. So there's this long silence. And then one of the kids said, we could help you with this. And then the, uh, all the other kids said, yeah, if you, if you want to be you and, and not have to bully people and, you know, push them around and stuff, we're all in this together. We'll work with you. And she burst into tears. Yeah. And it was, it was a huge moment for me. Like it was many years ago, but it was a huge moment for me because first off, she was so courageous to say that she felt safe to say this. Yeah. Feel, thinking that, well, you know what? I may have to be, bring, be brought to account by the group. This group may say, you know, we're not putting up with this. Maybe your mom saved you in the past. No, we're not going to save you. You know, yeah. so she put it out there and they, you know, if, if you really want to do this, we'll help you. <laughs> which, is, which is what, what we, I mean, that's what vulnerability does, right? It, it allows us to discover better versions of ourselves because, you know, it's our, our own formation is develop. It's self-development is not a self activity, right? Developing ourselves is always a group activity. Um, we don't ever form outside of the context of relationships, but you have to have the vulnerability to admit where you need help. And they, you may not get a good response. They may just criticize you more. But the fact that you were courageous to show the, the vulnerability gives you the strength to move on to that next point. I think so often we, we're not, it's, we don't have the, cur- the strength of character, or the courage to admit that when somebody gives us a horrible response or is a, unkind or cruel or dismissive of our own needs, we're probably in the wrong group. That's probably not a set of people we ought to be associating with. Or uh, it's time. Healing time is required sometimes. Maybe the reason you were drawn to that group in the first place is no longer a, a just reason to stay. And that requires some hard soul searching to say, am I willing to deal with the isolation of transition to find a better group or a better team or a better organization or a better you know, community to be part of where what I'm discovering and learning about myself can thrive? Yeah. Or am I committed enough to this relationship or to this group that I'm willing to work through it? Yep. And, 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 and make the trade-offs, right? Sometimes those differences are tolerable and it's just being honest about the trade-off, right? It's and what am I going to have to compromise to stay? And, what are, are, and are they willing to compromise anything to have me? Mm-hmm. And if you're the one making all the investment and the group is not c- commenting at all, that's probably important data to note. Yeah, I know it's too much of an imbalance. It doesn't result in a healthy group relationship. So let me ask you the next uh, uh, question, which is right about where we're at right now with groups, which is that, you know, uh, culture is any group, any two people together start to form a culture and it grows from there. You can have regional cultures, you can have national cultures, language cultures, religious cultures, professional cultures, you know, neighborhood cultures. There's many, there are many of them and we're born into many of them. Mm -hmm. They form us without us knowing it. So Mm -hmm. of the groups that you were born into, can you talk a little bit about the groups that you feel formed you and in what ways they did? Well, certainly my family. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm the product of a very classic textbook, New York City, Italian, big family. Lots of uh, love, lots of unfiltered emotions, uh, a lot of humor, a lot of dysfunction. But I think at the end of the day, a tremendous amount of love. And I think I'm very blessed that 
you know, you watch The Sopranos and you think it's fiction. I watch The Sopranos and I think it's Thanksgiving. And so there's a, there's a, there, there, it's real. It's a real culture. Um, so at the origins, that's where my story starts. Certainly I was very drawn to creative groups. Um, my youth group at my church was an extraordinarily formative uh, experience for me uh, in so many fronts in, in, in terms of my, my values and, and what I thought community was and how I formed friendships and how I learned to participate in someone else's life and how I invited them to participate in mine. Very, very formative experiences. Creative groups, artistic groups, um, sports teams. You know, I, 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 from an early age, was very fascinated by the organization of human endeavor people coming together to accomplish something they couldn't accomplish on their own. I was the kid that organized the fundraiser. I wanted to bring the block party together. People wanted to play stickball. I organized the game. I thought I was just, a, I had a natural fascination of what happens when humans collaborate. And I think that my career in organizational behavior and organizational psychology is a result of that fascination. Um, and so groups that, you know, wanted to find a common aspiration and go achieve it were always the most inspiring and continue to be the most inspiring for me. Hmm, that's great. That's also a characteristic of many of the entrepreneurs that I meet, you know, that they, they would go and they would take charge of a situation and they would experiment socially with it to see how it was going to happen, what was going to happen. And then they'd reflect afterwards and say, hmm, what worked, what didn't work? How could I do this differently next time? I've seen that and heard it from a number of different people. And I'm, I'm interested in that, that pattern. Well, I think I think the challenge, you know, many entrepreneurs to be great entrepreneurs are very counter dependent, which makes them very poor collaborators. They're fine as the conductor. They don't want to play first chair. And I think the downside of that is if you never learn to be one among equals, you don't really understand the nature of true interdependence, which is what you have to create, which is why many serial entrepreneurs start something and then leave, because once the requirements for interdependence start to show up, they're no longer interested. And so I think uh, for me, I actually, I actually really enjoy collaborating. Uh, I don't need to be the conductor. I'm happy to, to give someone else the baton and go watch in the back if I have to, or play an instrument. So I think uh, for me, uh, when I work with startup leaders, I, I'm always fascinated when they say, I want to feel something part of, I want to feel part of something greater than myself. And I always say, that's interesting, but you're always by yourself. How will you feel part of something greater than yourself if you actually don't feel part? And I think it's, it's, the, it's the, every entrepreneur's dilemma, right? They want to, they feel born and wired to blaze a trail, to the courage to go, you know, boldly where no one's gone before, to champion their ideas, to take risks. And we need those people. They're, they're phenomenal gifts to our world. And they suffer. I mean, mental health issues among entrepreneurs are, are known to be large because they suffer in silence. They suffer their own uh, counterdependence. They suffer their own isolation and loneliness. And when it comes time... And, to ask, and they become too convinced that their own ideas are right. Well, that's... So they, they suffer from chronic certainty. Chronic certainty. That's a great one. I love it. Chronic certainty. Yeah. Uh, we, have a new, we have an HBR article coming out on you know how to deal with someone who suffers from chronic certainty. Um, the reality is that you know, they're often, their ideas are often good. One of the reasons why second entrepreneurs fail so highly, right? If your first entrepreneurial effort was successful, you have a 90% success chance of failing the second time because you take that certainty with you. And so, uh, you know, I would wish for entrepreneurs to, the, you know, the, the, the experience of learning to suspend disbelief, to truly be interdependent and vulnerable and let it be okay that you're not one among equals, but just one of equals. Um, it's hard for them to learn. The ones that do learn it or can find a blend of their own voice, the me, we, um, do phenomenally and they become great. They learn to go on to be great leaders. The ones that can't learn it, sometimes they have, they're have great serial entrepreneurs, so they're great starting up things and then they want to move on. And they at least they're smart enough to turn the baton over to somebody else when they need to step aside. It's the ones that stay too long and, and build their identity around the thing they've built or their idea and shadow everybody. They become and, dictators. Or, or benevolent Santa Claus dictators, right? They become lovely, jolly people who give, who buy people's loyalty. Yeah, it's so paternalistic. It's highly paternalistic. Yeah. And, and people atrophy. People don't realize they're atrophying under that kind of leader, but it's so easy. And the leader's atrophying too, because they become victims of their own ego. And they don't even see it until it's too late. Right, yeah. exactly, until they crash. So let me go on to this next piece because really your answers are so wonderful. I could keep talking forever without ever going to any of my questions. <laughs> but let me go to this next one, which is about personality and temperament. So your temperament you were born with, and you seem to have a propensity to be able to see outside, see somebody else's experience, be sensitive to that experience and seek it out. For, from just talking to you, that's what I see. But I'll bet you you have other things that you feel you were born with that would be part of your temperament. Can you talk about any of those that come to mind? Um, I don't know if, if, if you spent any time with my family at all, you, you would 
immediately presumed that sarcasm was genetic, uh, and that may be just the function of growing up in a, a New York loud Italian family, but it certainly <laughs> appears to be, I mean, wit, wit f- humor. And I'm the, and listen, I'm the youngest of five in my family, and I'm, when it comes to sarcasm, I'm the amateur, and people tell me I'm funny all the time. You know, I think, you know, nature versus nurture has always been a very fascinating debate for me, and just when I think I've got that started through, somebody else comes along and is the exception to the rule. So I But think- for you and your family, is that something that, something that you feel, you know, like, for example, I have four kids. So my oldest one from the very get-go was very philosophical in his orientation. He liked to think things through and, and then make a measured decision, right? And the second one, ah, this is fun. Let's go with this. You know, like from the time they were born, they were like that. So yeah. have you noticed that? Well, I think, you know, I think um, I'm sure people, my, my, you know, my, I have a sister who's 20 years older than I am. She would say that I was free spirited and creative from the very beginning. I was the kid that colored outside the lines for a reason. Um, I, you know, that, you know, I think that re- rebellion is just unredeemed creativity and leadership. But, but interestingly enough, uh, by, by nature, I'm also an introvert. If you look at my Myers-Briggs, I'm not grossly over on the eye side, but substantially on it, enough so that people often confuse my personality traits, so my communication style, which is all learned behavior, with extroversion. And I exhaust when I'm around people too much. Like there are times when I'm in meetings, I can feel my body gasping for my hotel room to just get away and have, have quiet. Um, you know, and- so many actors have that. They're really introverts. They're amazing on the stage and people feel like they just are talking to them and they want to go be friends with them. But after, as soon as they get off the stage, it's like, you know, I need my alone time and I don't really want to talk. <laughs> yeah. It's the same when I'm with clients or in uh, speaking to an audience or at a conference. I just, um, my people points run out and I'm often aware when they're, when the gas hangs on and it's time to go. <laughs> Totally. Mm-hmm. So then that brings me to to personality, which is a combination of all those experiences learned and how you adapted to various obstacles. So what would you say you've learned along the way that's become part of who you are and your leadership style? Gosh, I think um, curiosity. I, I am an insatiable learner. I love to learn new things. I love I, that's how I problem solve is I learn. When I, I think I get my discontentious up when I don't know something or when I can't figure something out, especially if it's on behalf of somebody that I'm trying to help. And so that for me becomes the I often think God invented Google for me because it's just a, a faster way to consume more information and indulge my curiosity or wonder about things. So I, I don't have pride of authorship. You know, I'm, I love having ideas. I love letting them go. I think sometimes I've had, I've had to teach people that don't confuse the conviction with which I express an idea with my commitment to it because they're not the same thing. <laughs> Um, I can be convicted about an idea, you know, that sounds as staunch and resolute as you can think of. And then in a second later, have my mind easily changed. So anyway, information is a I, I don't, joy. My, um, so if you think about the love language spectrum, mine is service. So uh, help. Uh, the problem is, you know, the, you know, it's help, gifts, words of affirmation, touch, you know, but the problem is I don't have a continuum of those. It's help or nothing. So when people try and show me love and care in those other languages, it's always interesting to me. But if you just come help me file the papers on the desk behind me or stop and do an errand for me, I will think you, I won the lottery. And so I think that's my introversion, sort of reaching out from inside saying, I, I really do like help. It doesn't look like that, but I really do love help. There used to be, I don't know, because I'm in a different part of the world from you, but around where I was, uh, there was this sort of plaque a lot of people had in their kitchen. And it said, all of the compliments, all the good wishes, never replace help with the dishes. Amen. Amen. (laughs) That's the language of love is service. (laughs) And my my wife's love language is gifts. She loves gifts. Um, And so um, I had, that's a learned behavior for me. I'm happy to do it. You know, I've had a teacher that just know that mine is not the same. So (laughs) when you buy me gifts, I'm not going to be as ecstatic as when I buy you gifts. (laughs) And, you know, um, we all love physical touch to be hugged and cared for. We love words of affirmation. So they're, they're, they're nice things. But if you really want to reach deep inside my soul, you know, oh. take the garbage out for me. That's good self-awareness, too. I'd say we, we, we learn self-awareness as we get older for reflecting. Uh, let me go to the next one, which is, I mean, you said you grew up in a loud New York Italian family. And so that would be alert. That would, that's you picked that culture up and ways of doing things. And there might have been other things where you experienced, uh, you ran into an obstacle and you were, wait a minute, uh, not everybody does things like this. So that would be, you know, a cultural realization. Whoa, I thought everybody was like that. So do you have any moments like that, that you can think of? 
Absolutely. I moved to Seattle, you know, where you really should require a passport to come here from New York. The culture is so different. And I knew it was different. I wasn't naive to think it was like New York, but boy, was I unprepared for how different the West Coast is from the East Coast. First of all, it's 150 years younger. But beyond that, it is a very, very different culture than New York. I, you know, I, I tell my friends back in New York, um, Seattle's an acquired taste and I'm still acquiring it, even after 14 years. Can you think of an incident specifically that, that really... Oh. I can think of hundreds just driving to the supermarket. So here, if, if you're in New York and you're in a restaurant and you lean over to a table uh, and you say, I'm sorry, that looks good. What did you order? A New Yorker will say, oh, it's the pasta. It's great. You want to taste it? If you, if you look over, if you so much of it, look over and someone else's plate, if just look in their direction in Seattle, you get this. Like, it's like what do you turn away? Like you're invading on my privacy. Just yeah, turn your head. Um, the way I, the way someone explained to me when I got here, which was really power, wonderful. It, they said, look, New Yorkers are really, really friendly, but they're not polite. Seattle people are really, really polite, but they're not friendly. Yes. And I'm like, that's it. And so I've had to learn to adapt. I, I came out here to, to be part of a, uh, a grad school, an academe. So I taught, I was in, in, in the administration of that grad school. Here I was not a, th- uh, a clinician by training, not a theologian by training, not an academic by training not a, a doctorate by training, and a New Yorker coming to a clinical training school in Seattle. Tough crowd. Well, a tough crowd and like going to landing on Mars. Yeah. Uh, so it does not qualify as my best career decision ever. Um, wound up being ultimately, for who I got to become in the process, a wonderful career move, but not without its costs. When you intentionally remove yourself from the culture you know and put yourself in a foreign place. And I lived all over the world. I've lived in dozens of different countries and, and worked in them, but I always had home. And so to, to take and, and you know, marry with two kids, to uproot yourself and do that, you will suffer to do that. But if you allow yourself to be formed by it, it can be very powerful. And that also allows you to experience more people's stories. And different stories and learn yes. how to engage them differently how, and learn how to let them see you in a different light when they've concocted you in some way you don't want to be concocted. Right. That's great. Really good example. I love the re- that restaurant example. And you'd see that in other countries too. There are lots of things that can be disconnected, but it's really interesting when people can name them. I'm always surprised when people can't name any. And to me, that's because if they can't name any, they must be in a bubble. <laughs> I mean, Seattle is a very pedestrian city. It's really kind of scary. So I live on the east side of Seattle. If you know, if you know the darker bit, it's, it's split by a lake. And just the notion of going across the bridge, which is off 17 minutes into Seattle, people think it's like a day trip. Ah. People don't leave their bedroom communities. Um, and each one of them has a very different culture. Um, and so it's funny, the east now, now, with some of the horrible social situations Seattle's facing, even the east side and Seattle have become too different worlds but it's a very pedestrian city unfortunately and so it does not make for blending of tolerance and and openness to those different experiences yeah so that must be just it just makes me think of something else when you're saying that so what you have to offer coming from new york with your experience and your temperament and your learned experiences on all your travels can be very useful for people in seattle and it could because that would give them a breadth of experience that they probably would never have sought out or even believed existed. But also their depth of experience could be very useful for you as well. Because depth mm-hmm. of experience in a geological location over several generations can be can give you different kinds of insights. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. So you could probably I mean, it's something you can both benefit from, but you never know where the opportunities will be to to have that happen. Yeah, for sure. So I was thinking, you know, maybe you let's say you were ready to be employed by somebody and you had this luxury where the employer said you know how could we best use your talents what would be a great way to work with you what Mm. would you tell them i would say be open to looking in mirrors that you haven't looked in before know that i will be a fierce advocate for your success but know that sometimes to fight for you means i have to fight with you Uh, and that means you have to be willing i will advocate for you publicly but in private you have to hear things that maybe you don't want to hear but they are in your best interest to hear and act upon. Um, I'm not here for my benefit. My success is when you succeed. So if you want to work with us at Navalent, you have to know that it's not for the faint of heart. Um, One of the best referrals we ever got from a CEO, one of our CEOs, I had asked him to do a reference for us and to another CEO in his city. And he called me uh, afterwards and I said, so how did it go? He said, yeah, I told him not to hire you. I said, that wasn't really the reference I was looking for. Why did you do that? He said he wasn't serious about change. 
I said, well, how do you know that? He said, <clears throat> he talked about his board of directors and wanting to make it look like, you know, he was responding to their concerns. But I said, do not let these people near your organization if you are not serious about change. Because the minute they enter the building, things will start to be different. And if you're only looking to make it look like you're changing something, you're hiring a howitzer for what you need a handgun for. So don't hire them. And it was a, ba- a very backward way of him saying, you have your, your, your people of impact. Um, and so you on- only should aim yourself at places that really want impact. So I think, uh, you know, don't hire Navalent if you're looking to create the appearance of change. Only hire Navalent if you really actually are serious about change. Which is great because that also both attract and repel. So it's going to attract the right customer. It's going to repel the person who's not a good fit. Right. We've had our share of skin knees before. (laughs) I'm sure. So that also gives you an opportunity to just tell me a little bit about Navalent and what you do. Yeah, so we spend our days accompanying leaders of all kinds on journeys of disruptive and bumpy transformations, whether it's of themselves, of their organizations, or their divisions. And we help them craft those journeys and th- be thoughtful about not uh, being reckless about them or overly paralyzed by them, but to be thoughtful about how they shape the identity of their teams and organizations and thoughtful about how they form as leaders and thoughtfully about how they design their organizations to be able to perform optimally and make people thrive. So... Would you say you're like change agents or? You know, at the places where we, where organizations form strategy and design organizations and build leaders, those are the sort of the three circles we play in. Say those three circles again for me. Defining strategy. Yeah. You know, setting direction and, and, and being honest about your identity in the marketplace, designing mm-hmm. your organization. So how you configure the capabilities of what you're good at to deliver that strategy. And then how you lead, how you engage others, how you set direction, how you inspire others to perform, how you set priorities how you understand yourself and your own behavior and how others experience it and how you grow in the areas where you're not. Yeah, so it'll be personal and organizational soul searching. And then when you're confronted with those things, what are you going to do with them kind of thing? So right. you accompany them on that journey because otherwise people feel abandoned. Exactly. You, we, and we, we've all, all of our organizations have large piles of false starts of changes that were set in motion that never went anywhere. And the, that creates incredible, incredible battle fatigue for organizations. And so you, you, you long lose your right to say, okay, but this time I'm really serious because people, you, you create a very large, this too shall pass club. Mm-hmm. And then nobody wants to play. And then when you really need them to engage in change, you've lost their confidence. So for us, it is a, <clears throat> you need to look in the mirror and see what's there, but then you need to construct a journey that you actually can stick to. Right. That's got to be one that you can do, not not right. something that's way far away from you or just some little thing that's not going to make a difference. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we're not, as human beings, we need accompaniment, right? I mean, to your point about groups, we need each other to do that. We're horrible re- observers of our own reality. And so if we don't have other eyes on that journey, it's highly unlikely we'll be successful. Accompaniment is a word that's coming more and more into use. And I think it really describes well what's required for people to be able to move into something. Because without the accompaniment, they can't. They can't move away. They can't move towards. And they can't move in. They can get started. But in order for it to take roots, it requires accompaniment. And then they require for them to accompany others along the journey. It becomes part of a, you know, playing it forward thing as well. Um, and I think most leaders don't even know where to start, so they freeze, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they fear accompaniment. They fear accompaniment not to be safe, or uh, they, they're skeptical about it. Um, and my gosh, I, I, three and a half years ago, I hired a coach for me to take, my, take a little bit of my own medicine and because I needed help. And was the best decision I ever made. I, I, I mean, for the whole first year, I kept thinking, I hope people feel this way about me uh, when, I, when I help them. But I don't understand how, pe- how could you go without help? How could any of us? not want the, the trusted advice and counsel and support of somebody who can give us expertise we haven't got ourselves and don't need. When, when, leave it to the professionals. You know, you stick to your swim lane and let somebody else guide you in that. Um, I, it, having help on the journey is the, one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves. Um, I just don't understand why more people don't do it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And you know, it just occurred to me that I didn't ask you another question I wanted to ask just before we, we reach the end. And that is, of the different places you've lived and cultures you have become a part of, not the ones you were born into, and they can also be professional cultures, what have you adopted? I think learning. I think if I look at all the places where, the organizations where I've worked or the communities that I feel most uh, drawn to, it's people who are asking really hard questions uh, of themselves and of their work and willing to go find the answers to those questions. Organizations that value learning, that value um, continuous improvement, that value poking the status quo or challenging given assumptions uh, are places where I really enjoy. Okay, I'm going to provoke you on that one. 
Um, so, for example, I have spent a lot of time around Persians, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe 30 years around Persian, Persians in the Iranian community. Um, and Persians have a habit of being very reverent in the way that they greet people. Mm -hmm. You go around the room, you have to kiss everybody, hug them, um, shake hands, uh, you have to ask them about their family, that sort of thing. Uh, and they're also much more formal. Mm -hmm. I was not raised in a formal environment, it's much more informal here. I have adopted the Persian way of greeting people most of the time. I actually believe in formality, whereas before I didn't. I thought it was a complete waste of time. So I feel that those things now, if they're not there, that they're significantly missing. That was not a part of my culture. So you can say learning, but it's kind of broad. Is there a specific behavior that you are a specific? Um, so um, I mean, similar to yours, it's inquiry. Tell me what you're working on. Tell me, tell me what, tell me how you did it. I love asking for the story when someone tells me about an accomplishment. I'm like, oh, tell me how you did it. Tell me about, tell me how you got there. What was hard about it? I think it's one of the greatest compliments and expressions of appreciation we can give somebody who does something is to ask for the story. It's one of the most under leveraged tools a leader has to express gratitude is rather than saying, thanks, way to go. Just say, tell me how you did it. Because when somebody tells you their story, they come alive, they become animated, they become excited, they feel proud. Uh, and that's when they're learning. Uh, because when they're synthesizing an accomplishment, they're actually pulling from a very different part of their brain to tell you that story and it solidifies the accomplishment and what they learned. So I love asking people because I, I just love watching them light up when they tell the story. Yeah, stories are really important and people often don't get a chance to tell their story. They may in fact have never told it. And um, that's almost always the case, Marie. Mm -hmm. And which is sometimes you have to keep, a you have to keep asking till they get better at knowing their story because most of us don't know our own story. Totally. Um, and yeah. when you don't know your story, um, you're going to repeat history in ways that you don't want to. Totally. So, Ron, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Gosh, if, you know, if your listeners are in, intrigued by any of this, I'd love them to stay in touch. If you come to our website at navalent, N-A-V-A-L-E-N-T dot com slash transformation, you can get one of our, our, our free ebook on leading transformation and learn more about how we think about people in, in cultures and environments and how we think about change there. We also got great videos and blogs and uh, we just launched a brand new website uh, with all kinds of new resources on it. And so come hang out with us and le learn with us. Um, also at Twitter at, at Ron Carucci and on LinkedIn. So stay in touch. That's great. I will definitely have all of that in the show notes so that people can look it up and they can be in touch with you, which will be great. And I'm sure that your ebook is very valuable. I'm going to go download a copy myself. Uh, and I also would like to put in a pitch for uh, your book that's on Amazon, which is called Rising to Power. I mentioned it earlier on. It really, it sounds like it would be useful for so many people because this idea of 50% of leaders failing within their 18 months of being promoted is, I mean, that's something that we can definitely learn from your longitudinal study on that. I think that would be very, very useful. In fact, I was wondering if there's one insight that you could leave us with from that book. Sure. Um, and there's a, a, one of my TED Talks is on the findings uh, in terms of how, for anybody wanting to have influence, mm -hmm. how it is you think about it. Um, so context was one of the major findings. You have to read the tea leaves around you. You have to be curious. You have to adapt your ideas. You can't impose change or impose thinking um, when you arrive. You actually have to... Um, you have to read the reality around you. Read the room, read the reality, and adapt accordingly. Mm -hmm. Contextual intelligence. Perfect. Exactly what's been missing in highly individualistic societies. Yes. Well, Ron, I really appreciated this interview and this time. It's, it's just great to hear from you. I, I, I learned a lot, and I enjoyed it so much. And thank you so much for being a guest. Marie, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Have a wonderful day and rest of the week. You do the same. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Ron Carucci, a very accomplished man who helps companies focus, clarify, and reach their business goals through targeted change management and accompaniment. His underlying focus to find and highlight people's stories and his constant intention to be of service are key values he clearly lives by. I'm really looking forward to reading his book, Rising to Power, which you can find on Amazon. An article on Ron's website that you might find thought-provoking is called Provoking Good in a World of Outrage. Check out the links in the show notes. Thank you in advance for sharing and rating this podcast. You can send me a message at marie at shiftworkplace.com to offer opinions and suggestions for upcoming speakers or go to Boxer to leave me a voice message. If you leave a voice message, who knows, you just might find yourself on one of the upcoming episodes for the Culture and Leadership Connection podcast. Thank you for listening and may cultural and leadership insights continue to inspire and guide your day.